Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this new series that we're just getting started on is entitled Ezra and Nehemiah. And the second lesson in that series is entitled Nehemiah. It's the second lesson for October 12 of 2019. And we'd like to do as usual by starting with a prayer, a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we've gathered here as people watch in um, to discuss these very important events of long ago and what implications they might have for us, what lessons we can learn from their courage and fortitude. Help us now to understand more clearly the experience of Nehemiah as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we pick up really from where we were last week. Uh, in our last lesson, discussing some of the details about Nehemiah, who is, of course, the second main character in our study for this quarter. Following the orders from Cyrus, Zerubbabel, and Joshua had returned with about 50,000 people to begin the rebuilding of the temple, as well as Jerusalem and the county in the country of Judea following the Babylonian exile. And they are, that was prophesied, remember, by in, in Jeremiah that they would be in captivity for about 70 years. Because of a lot of opposition from the surrounding nations and groups, the building of the temple showed, uh, slowed down and stopped. Then a second degree from Darius or Darius, and the urging of two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, stirred the people to complete the building of the temple. But there was still no completed wall around the city of Jerusalem, and there was no real safety for the people who lived there. In fact, you'll find, if you read carefully in Ezra and Nehemiah, they were begging people to come and live again around Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. So as our story picks up with Nehemiah, he was working in Susa or Shushan, far away from Jerusalem, in the country of Persia, or what is now known as Iran. Are those two names for the two different pronunciations two different or spellings of the yeah, same place? Yeah. He had the very responsible position of serving the emperor his wine and other drinks and tasting them first to make sure that they were not poisoned in some way. We do not know how long Nehemiah had been working for the emperor. However, he had come to be a trusted part of the emperor's inner circle of workers. But Nehemiah was concerned about the news coming from Jerusalem. Despite the two decrees which had been issued already from two different emperors, progress toward establishing a safe place to live and rebuild the city of Jerusalem in the country of Judea had pretty much ground to a stop. So, Look at Nehemiah 1, 1 to 4, just to get us going here. This is the account of what Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, accomplished. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year that Artaxerxes was emperor of Persia, I, Nehemiah, was in Susa, the capital city. Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived from Judah with another group, and I asked them about Jerusalem and about our fellow Jews who had returned from exile in Babylonia. They told me that those who had survived and were back in the homeland were in great difficulty and that the foreigners who lived nearby looked down on them. They also told me that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down and that the gates had not been restored since the time they were burnt. When I heard all this, I sat down and wept. For several days I mourned and did not eat, and I prayed to God. Okay, so we're going to link that to some things that happened in Daniel and in the book of Daniel with similarities. Dennis? Uh, yes, this is from Daniel uh, 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year that Jehoiakim was king of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia attacked Jerusalem and surrounded the city. The Lord let him capture King Jehoiakim and seize some of the temple treasures. He took some prisoners back with him to the temple of his gods in Babylon and put the captured treasures in the temple storerooms. This is Good News Bible. Okay. Moving on. And Margaret? I think this is, this is uh, from Nehemiah 1, 1 to 4. And yeah. this is the account of what Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, accomplished. Mm -hmm. And I just realized I had just is, read that, that for you. That is just what you just read. That's right. Okay, let's move on. Hanani, and probably a blood brother of Nehemiah, had arrived with some friends uh, from Jerusalem. My computer wants to keep jumping here. 
and brought the news that every time the Jews tried to rebuild a portion of the wall around Jerusalem, their enemies would either tear it down or burn it down. They were not, things were not going well in his ancestral home. As we will learn in, in, in later lessons, it is possible to date the events in these two uh, books quite precisely. It is likely that the arrival of Hanani occurred between the middle of November and the middle of December of 445 B.C. Ezra had been back in Jerusalem for about 13 years already, despite the fact that he had been given permission to use money which was left over from the gifts he had brought from the emperor, the wall was far from completed. Furthermore, a following, following a letter written by their enemies, King Artaxerxes himself had sent a decree for them to stop building the city and the wall. Ezra 4.23 says, As soon as this letter from Artaxerxes was read to Rehum, Shimshai, and their associates, they hurried to Jerusalem and forced the Jews to stop rebuilding the wall. Okay. So even though the temple had been built, it was not really safe for people to live in Jerusalem to carry out the normal temple services. What would you have done if you had been in Nehemiah's place? Well, Nehemiah began a campaign of what? Praying, fasting, and weeping. That would be quite a job to think about. So, Nehemiah 1, 5 through 11 from the Good News Bible says, Lord God of heaven, you are great, and we stand in fear of you. You faithfully keep your covenant with those who love you and do what you command. Look at me, Lord, and hear my prayer as I pray day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess that we, the people of Israel, have sinned. My ancestors and I have sinned. We have acted wickedly against you and have not done what you commanded. We have not kept the laws which you gave us through Moses, your servant. Remember now what you told Moses. If you, if you people of Israel are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the other nations. But then, if you turn back to me and do what I have commanded you, I will bring you back to the place where I have chosen to be worshipped, even though you are scattered to the ends of the earth. Lord, these are your servants, your own people. You rescued them by your great power and strength. Listen now to my prayer and to the prayers of all your other servants who want to honor you. Give me success today and make the emperor merciful to me. In those days, I was the emperor's wine steward. Okay, notice the clear pattern in this prayer with progressing and retracing. God, you are great and have mercy. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah 1 5. Hear me. I'm sorry, my computer is doing funny things here. That's Three, new. confession of sins. Four, remember your promises. And then mirroring number three again, you have redeemed us. Two, hear me. One, God grant prosperity and mercy. That's from our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide. So, does that pattern sound familiar to anybody? Chiasm. It's a chiasm. And there are a lot of them in the Bible. It was common for people in those days to, to build up to a point and then come down back the other side. Uh, there are many of them. The entire book, Song of Solomon, is a chiasm. Uh, Psalm 1... What? Revelation. Revelation is a chiasm. Uh, Psalm 109, 110, I believe it is, is a chiasm. He put the two books together and so forth. So that's the explanation of what we just saw there. So the most important part of a chiasm is the middle. It is in the middle, that's correct. So remember it's your like promises. A pyramid, isn't it? Yes, it is. What is happening here? Okay. In several ways, Nehemiah's prayer resembles the prayer of Daniel, recorded in Daniel 9. Do you think that Nehemiah might have actually read the book of Daniel? We do not know how those original manuscripts of Scripture were preserved and copied. We just don't know. But like Daniel, Nehemiah did not start off his prayer by crying for help. He recalled God's great mercy. He claimed God's goodness. He, and he confessed his sins and the sins of his people. Then he asked God to remember his promises. 
He reminded God that he had rescued them from their problems in the past and he believed that God could do it again. Might that be um, a pattern for us to think about when we pray to God? Do we have promises? Do we need to remind God of what he's done for us? Or is it reminding us of what God has done for us? Okay. I think it reminds for us to focus on what he has done for us brings out. Yep. Our, my question is, um, are Daniel and Nehemiah contemporaries? No. Well, sort of. No. Sort of. We don't know for sure. Because Daniel was just a kid when he was taken yeah. to Babylon. So by the time the by the time Zerubbabel and crew took cool. the group back, Daniel was 90 plus. Okay. So That's if five thirty six, yeah, somewhere in there. So we're uh, talking. But about Nehemiah would have been. Nehemiah was still a, a vigorous man in four forty four. Oh. So it was a long time later. I don't think they were contemporaries. I don't either. Yeah. But like Daniel, Nehemiah did not start off his prayer by crying for help. He recalled God's mercy and so forth. Then he asked God to remember His promises. He reminded God that He had rescued them from problems in the past, and he believed that God could do it again. So what could we learn from Nehemiah's prayer? Is it appropriate to remind God of his previous promises? I think God's happy when we're thinking about him. Absolutely. When are thinking positively about him. Yeah, you know, mm-hmm. thinking about him, you know, mm-hmm. communing. We know that there's nothing faulty in God's memory. But in the context of the great controversy, when we openly remember God's promises and admit our mistakes and then ask for help, it gives God permission in the setting of the great controversy to turn to the devil and say, you see, these people are asking me to do something. I am not forcing myself on them as you, Satan, would try to do. I will now act. Very important to realize that praying like that gives God permission to do things that he couldn't otherwise do in the context of the great controversy. He couldn't because Satan would say that's a foul. Mm Mm-hmm. That's exactly. unfair. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, Nehemiah was not only a man of prayer, but also a man of action? Yes, Nehemiah often poured out his soul on behalf of his people. But now, as he prayed, a holy purpose formed in his mind. He resolved that if he could obtain the consent of the king and the necessary aid in procuring implements and material, he would himself undertake the task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and restoring Israel's national strength. And he asked the Lord to grant him favor in the sight of the king, that this plan might be carried out. Prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, he entreated, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For my... Four months, Nehemiah waited for a favorable opportunity to present his request to the king. It's from Prophets and Kings. Yeah. Do you think of Nehemiah's prayers might have taken the form of planning with God what needed to be done? We know that Jesus, when he was here on this earth, he basically planned each day in prayer with God. Might Nehemiah have done something like that? Mm-hmm. Would God guide someone like Nehemiah and us to discuss together plans for accomplishing what needs to be done? What do you think? Well, following those four months of weeping, fasting, and praying, Nehemiah's opportunity came. Do you think he ever got tired of appealing to God? Does this prayer as recorded in Nehemiah 1 represent more or less the same things that he prayed about each day? I suspect yes. You think so? Okay. Jim? Nehemiah 2, 1 through 8. One day, four months later, an emperor, Artaxerxes, was dining. I took the wine to him. He had never seen me look sad before. So he asked, Why are you looking so sad? Aren't you ill? Excuse me, you aren't ill. So I must, excuse me, so it must be that you are unhappy. I was startled and answered, May your majesty live forever. How can I help looking sad when the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. The emperor asked, what is, that, what is it that you want? I prayed to the God of heaven, and then I said to the emperor, 
If your majesty is pleased with me and is willing to grant my request, let me go down to the land of Judah, to the city where my ancestors are buried, so that I can rebuild the city. The emperor, with the empress sitting at his side, approved my request. He asked me how long it would I would be gone and when I would return, and I told him. Then I asked him to grant me the, the favor of giving me letters to the governors of West Euphrates province, instructing them to let me travel to Judah. I asked also for a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal feasts, instructing forest, him... To, forest. Royal forest, I'm sorry. <laughs> instructing him to supply me with timbers, timber for the gates of the fort that guards the temple, for the city walls and for the house I was in... I was to live in. The emperor gave me all I asked for because God was with me. This is from the Good News Bible. Okay, now That's let's stop story. and let's stop and think about this for a moment. Story. Great story, huh? Oh, yeah. Does Nehemiah know that that very Artaxerxes is the one who had formerly sent a letter forbidding them to rebuild? Of course he does. Presumably he knows. Yeah. So what do you do? Remember, what do we know about the laws of the Medes and Persians? They cannot be changed. Remember the story of Esther? Mm -hmm. But in Esther, you know, he gave a subsequent decree that allowed uh, the, the Jews, Jews to, to respond, def to defend to fight themselves. Them. So, yeah. so it doesn't mean that he can't give another, in this situation, uh, another decree that was he that sort of overrides. In other words, they, they were told to yeah. stop at that time, but that doesn't, I don't know, did it say forever and ever, or just, no. it just well, said stop then? There's so. also the story of Daniel, mm -hmm. that the law of the Medes and Persians can't be changed, so Daniel went in the lion's den. Mm -hmm. That's right. So now, do you think Nehemiah was prepared to say something if the king said, oh, by the way, you know, I did send a letter over there and said to stop building. I'm sure he had, since it had been four months mm -hmm. that he was thinking this and planning it, I'm sure he'd thought of a lot of possibilities, and that's probably one. Do we have any idea what time period there was between the letter first back to tell him to stop building and his request? No, we don't know exactly, no. So we're um, speculating. On we're that. speculating. But it was the and same does person. does anyone know as Artaxerxes as son of Xerxes? And, uh, no, there's a Darius, or one or two Dariuses in the middle there. Xerxes is Ahasuerus. Mm -hmm. Then the next king is... I, Artaxerxes is the next king after Xerxes. Yeah, in the related table that we yeah. looked at last okay. lesson. Yeah, okay. So we don't know if it was a son. Nehemiah very carefully structured his request to the emperor. Initially, he did not mention Jerusalem. However, he talked about the place of his father's sepulchers. Why would he do that? That must have been important to the Persians, maybe. The honor there. Most of okay, there. Most ancestors. people. Yeah. I will tell you that there are many places in the world still today where you honor your elders. There are places I won't your mention your by ancestors. your ancestors. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, your ancestors. There are places today where people are buried above ground, and once a year people go there, pull them out, clean their bodies. I don't know. I mean, if sometimes there must, after a while, there must be nothing but bones left, and, and then rebury them every year to remember the important people in your, as your, among your ancestors. Well, down in Madagascar, I heard that some of the people, they, they dig them up or whatever they do, and then they dance with them, with their dead bodies. I mean, some oh, yes. Weird yes. cultures that you probably know more how about than that, I do. How does that work? How does a body... Well, or the bodies or the skeletons or whatever they are. They don't stick together. Well, they, even this I, Ebola stuff over there, the, pe the people, they get it physically involved with, with the Ebo Ebola uh, bone victims. Houses. They bury somebody yeah. and you can yeah. stay there 20 years, then you have to give up your place 
to somebody well, else. Yeah, but they're in the shelf of screen. Mm -hmm. the bones out. Yeah, they well, I, I think of not, you know, if somebody's going to do a construction somewhere in the world, and also in here, and they find an ancient burial ground, and that sort of... In the Middle East, if you find any hint of ancient uh, archaeology or whatever kinds of stuff, you're trying to build a new building? Stop. We have to get the archaeologists out. We have to dig us up very carefully and figure it out. But particularly a burial ground, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know. The <laughs> Even here, yeah. Yeah, the yeah. Indian burial yeah. grounds are sacred. Sacred. Yeah. So that's, this is to give us a little feel for how they felt. To the people of antiquity and even to many peoples in our world today, respect for ancestors and even their proper burial sites is very important. So after he had wept and prayed and fasted for four months, do you think Nehemiah had a fairly clear plan in his mind about what he would ask of the emperor and then what he might be able to do in Jerusalem? Do you well, think his, his, the, the, his response seems to indicate that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He immediately yeah. said exactly what did him and Ha. Can you can you imagine you've gone from being a wine steward to be a governor? I mean that or a building did, supervisor. Did he immediately think that he would be able to do that kind of a job? Well, he lived in the he lived with you know in the, in the influence of the emperor yeah, and saw how true. government was work was you know how it was organized and how things worked in yeah. the government. Yeah, it almost implies that Nehemiah might have been a trusted advisor to the yeah. king. I, I don't know if that's true or not, yeah. but it, it almost implies that. Kind of like Daniel was. But the yeah. king had a lot of confidence in yeah. him and trusted him. Do you think God had anything to do with the fact that on that particular day, Nehemiah was looking sad? You know, that was a key point. He mm -hmm. looked sad. Mm -hmm. I guess if he thought about it for four months, he probably was getting more dismal all the time. I mean, he, he certainly must have known that he was asking this Medo-Persian Empire to reverse his course. Yeah, right, right at the end of the, uh, what um, Jim read there, the last, the emperor gave me all I asked for because God was with, with me. me. And uh, in Proverbs, there's a Let's see. It's, I think it's twenty-one one. Mm -hmm. uh, it says the king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Oh, that's beautiful. Very good. So, yeah. uh, so we see God at work. You know, it's, uh, Daniel said he it's, sets up kingdoms and he takes down kingdoms. Does that work for prime ministers and presidents too? It's a promise we can claim in those situations, <laughs> especially for them. <laughs> yes, they need it. Obviously not everyone, not all kings and emperors and presidents follow God's direction, though. No. That's what's called freedom of choice. Yes. But we can pray. Yes. And we can ask God's guidance. He, he was praying for four months and uh, fasting and praying. He wasn't just... Okay. So how long have Seventh-day Adventists been praying for the second coming? Seventh Adventists or Christians? Well, take your pick. Christians have been praying for almost 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Seventh day Adventists for 175, 70, 70, yeah. 175 years, more or less, since the Great Disappointment. Mm -hmm. So. For a while before, Adventists yeah. were praying before that. So, I mean, isn't the second coming in God's I mean, isn't something he, that something he wants to do? Do we remind him of what he wants to do? It's up to the Father. To he doesn't want to do it. No. It's, Jesus said he, nobody knows except the Father. I'm, I'm and, uh, acknowledging until, that. Until things are ready. Uh, and I remember seeing this uh, Messianic Jew talking about the marriage uh, tradition how the the man goes 
to the woman, and uh, and uh, then he goes to prepare a place for her, okay. and promises to come again and receive her unto himself. Okay. Uh, and if it were, and as the guy said, if it were up to him, he'd just throw something up and go get her. But it was up to the, it wasn't up to him to say when the house was ready. It was up to the father to say when the the house was ready. Oh, so. Uh, so we're waiting <laughs> so for God's. Is there any dowry involved in all of that, or? I, I don't recall him mentioning that. He mm-hmm. was he was kind of playing off of John fourteen one mm-hmm. one to three. Um, How does God decide when is the best time to and the best way and the best time to to do things? Don't we wish we say, knew? Who can? Say? God does what he wants to do, and he knows much better. It's not like we could have some kind of formula and say, well, yeah. all right, God, I, I know how it works. Well, let's, but let's be clear. God is not a capricious character. He's not just, no. boop, I guess I'll do that now. Um, he has reasons for doing what he does. Yes. Well, Nehemiah must have recognized that he was making a remarkable request. He probably knew that Artaxerxes himself had been the one sending a decree in response to the letters of Sanballat and Tobiah. And he's asking for letters to whom? Same people. Same people. Giving them permission to stop the work on the city of Jerusalem, and now he's asking permission to start it again. Then he was asking Artaxerxes to give him permission not only to restart the building of that wall, but also the authority to collect the wood and money necessary to rebuild, appointing him to be the governor of Judea. So here he says, okay, I'm going to make a dangerous journey. I'm going to arrive in a place where there's a bunch of people who don't want me to do what I'm planning to do at all. I'm going to hand them a letter from the emperor and I'm going to say, okay, because I've given you this letter from the emperor, you have to cooperate with me. Does that sound like... And he had an army with him. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't, well, yeah, that, that would, would help. <laughs> that would help. I, pro- I don't. I don't think it was probably a huge army, but some anyway. That would. Yeah. And I'm sure he he came dressed or or somehow with the right appropriate force of the fact that yes, this is from the emperor. Um, do you think Nehemiah was hoping that the emperor had forgotten about his former decree to stop the building in Jerusalem? That's why it would be interesting to know yeah. what space was between yeah. the time he was convinced to send an article to stop. Yeah, and then that can be two minutes later, and we've forgotten what we did. <laughs> Especially okay. if he's drinking a lot of wine. Yeah. Well, was he prepared to speak up? We've already talked about that. I mean, he, he must have been prepared to think about the idea that our Griffiths might say, oh, by the way... Didn't I write something about that in the past, you know? Well, it's quite interesting to notice that when this very special conversation took place, the empress was there alongside the emperor. Yeah, I thought so. Now, if you remember back just a few years to the days of of Esther, how often did women get involved in state councils and so forth? They didn't. But was and this a state council or was it just a meal? I mean, well, Nehemiah yeah. was there to taste the wine. So okay, okay the but let, may have influenced the. Let's let's the way maybe, but remember here we're now talking about women who were part of a harem. They were probably not supposed to be seen by any other people, any other men, once they were married to the king. But the wine taster has to be So there. that would be probably a clue. The wine taster probably has access to places that other people wouldn't have access to. But were they all considered queen or empress? Know. I mean, empress. Would, seems like she would be just one empress. He might yeah. have, have uh, concubines, but yeah. uh, one but empress. I would think that he would keep the empress particularly private to himself. Well, anyway... This was a special, some kind of a private meeting, perhaps, set up by the emperor to discuss this delicate issue. Especially if the emperor is about to change his mind, and he knows he's about to change his mind, and he knows that the other people know about that, 
Is he trying to avoid any repercussions? Nima had carefully calculated what he would need to accomplish and what needed to be done, including building lumber to build a house for himself. And I, the thing that I, that strikes me here, okay, this Asaph that was in charge of the royal force, do we have any idea where the royal force were? No. And, I mean, did he, at what point did Nehemiah build his own house? And did he need lumber to rebuild the wall? The How long would it take to get this lumber there for rebuilding? Yeah, for the gates he would he would need uh, Sure. The lumber. And how did they, the only way they could have kept the, the enemies from burning down the gates, they had to guard them 24-7. Well, Nehemiah had carefully calculated what he would need to accomplish what needed to be done. He needed time. He needed authority from the emperor to do it, to deal with Israel's enemies. And he would need supplies, especially wood for construction. He even mentioned specifically what he needed the wood for. He told the emperor, I need to build myself a house. Clearly, the emperor must have trusted Nehemiah and recognized his administrative skills in order to allow him to do such a thing. Gary, I think you're... Are you up next there? Yep. Yeah. Nehemiah 2, 9 to 10. The emperor sent some army officers and a troop of horsemen with me, and I made the journey to West Euphrates. There I gave the emperor's letter to the governors. But Sanballat from the town of Beth Horon and Tobiah, an official in the province of Ammon, heard that someone had come to work for the good of the people of Israel, and they were highly indignant. So there's not too much question about how what their response was, right? right. They thought, we thought we fixed that problem, right? Yeah. I can just see them. Okay. Nehemiah departed probably late in 444 B.C. with an armed guard and arrived in the province of West Euphrates sometimes called beyond the river, and depending which translation you're looking at, and handed to Sanballat and Tobiah the two decrees from the emperor giving him, giving him permission to collect the necessary supplies and take charge of the work in Jerusalem. Do you think he just casually walked in and said, oh, by the way, I need some help here? Or did he demand a very special, I mean, did the royal guard go with him? Probably. Yes. I would think. I would think, yeah. Well, he had letters. Yeah. Didn't mm -hmm. he? Saying from, from the emperor, you know, yeah. give this man what he needs. Yeah. So Nehemiah delivered his letters of authority to the appropriate enemies of the Jews. He knew that before long they would mount as much opposition as they could, so he did not waste time. Do you think Sanballat and Tobiah were shocked to receive those letters? Probably so, because they knew that the decrees from the laws of the Medes and the Persians weren't supposed to be changed. Were they disappointed? Probably. How long would it take for them to write a letter back to Artaxerxes and say, You promised! Well, you suggested, well, well I think uh, the... Go ahead. You suggested it might take an army a couple of weeks to travel so that, you know it's that would be a, a, a small group on horseback yeah. making speed it would take two weeks to get there and a time to get your letter and two weeks to get back at least okay so let's just send an email send an email yeah so I I think they got things stopped the first time because they sent back a bad report about mm -hmm. the Jews yeah. and what they were doing so in other words they lied Mm -hmm. So, but here they have somebody that's that's pretty official. I don't know if they felt like they could get around that or not. It's interesting to notice that the one in charge of the emperor's forest was a man named Asaph, and that's a Jewish name. Where else do we see the name Asaph quite, quite frequently? In the Psalms. Psalms. In the book of Psalms. Psalms. Not the same Asaph, know but who no. he was. another Asaph. What? Well, who was he in Psalms? He was a friend of David who was obviously a musician. That's much, about as much we know about him. Yeah. Tobiah, one of the opponents of the Jews, also had a Jewish name. 
although he was governor of Ammon at the time. Sanballat, the governor of Samaria, and Geshem, an Arab in charge of the former territories of Moab and Edom, were also determined to prevent what Nehemiah had come to do. So Ammon, Nehemiah, I mean Ammon, Moab, and Edom, what kind of countries, where, where did those people come from? Jordan, no. Beyond the Jordan. And they were relatives of the Jews. They were also descendants of Abraham. Mm -hmm. Okay? Dennis, oh. I think you're next. And this is from Prophets and Kings, Ellen White, uh, 635. Nehemiah's arrival in Jerusalem, however, with a, uh, with a military escort showing that he had come on some important mission, excited the jealousy of the heathen tribes living near the city who had so often indulged their enmity against the Jews by heaping upon them injury and insult. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. We... We haven't yet got to this information in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah still in the future, but what kind of connections did these enemies of Israel have with Jerusalem and the people living in Jerusalem? Do you have any idea? Well, they probably... Uh, they're, they're, they were probably descendants of people who had been living there before. Not only that... So they're being displaced... Later, we're going to find out that Tobiah, and I assume, I'm pretty sure it's the same Tobiah, actually had rented a room in the temple to store his supplies. They had spies all over the place. They were married. Intermarrying. Intermarrying here. So, I mean... Even with the priest's family, wasn't it? Even with the priest's family. It seemed like a daughter would marry. So... What does what That's does what does apartment. Nehemiah know when he shows up with a fancy royal emperor's guard of so forth and like this? What kind of word is going to go around? What's your step? Yeah, what's going on? What's going on? And immediately these other people and they have already received letters saying, you know, he has to go and inform these people that he's at least not tell them everything he's going to do, but give some hints. I mean, you know. They must have recognized, and then how long would it take him? I, I mean, I ask all kinds. I'm thinking of all kinds of questions about about this whole thing. Uh, how long would it take him to? Did did they rebuild the walls from stuff that had been just lying there for what 100 years now? Um, stones and blocks, maybe yes, but they would need new timber. How long would it take him to get the timber? Anyway, sorry, my mind's running away. Go ahead, Dennis. Yeah, Jim, That's are you okay. going to comment? We've got, we've got time. Yeah. Well, I just looked up, and uh, it's 40 years since Esther was made queen in 483. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at 444 when this took place. It's very conceivable that she's still there as a honorary matriarch. So yeah. Yeah. Very likely. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Foremost in this evil work were chief, uh, certain chiefs of these tribes, Sanballat the uh, Heronite, uh, Tobiah the Ammonite, and G uh, Geshem the Arabian. From the first, these leaders watched the critical, with critical eyes the movements of Nehemiah and endeavored by every means in their power to thwart his plans and hinder his work. Prophets and Kings. Now, we just noted that Tobiah is a Hebrew name. But it says he's an Ammonite. So whatever that means. Try uh, it to... He would be a descendant of the mixed multitude that, uh, you know, when one. they took Jews away, maybe he, he was descendant of a, a Levi. My cousins. One of yeah. the, the priests that they came back to instruct. Um, so try to imagine how you would feel handing letters of authority to accomplish something that they didn't want to be done to people who, in fact, wanted you dead. How does that sound? <laughs> it's kind of scary to me. Nehemiah was yeah. pretty careful when they read this next section. Yeah, you okay. Know, and how he decided what it, we have a few what minutes. And how we should do. I, we have a few minutes. Let me Fair just enough. read this next section. I went on to Jerusalem and for three days... So where are you reading from? I'm reading from Nehemiah chapter 2, 11 to 20. 
I went on to Jerusalem, and for three days I did not tell anyone what God had inspired me to do for Jerusalem. Then in the middle of the night I got up and went out, taking a few of my companions with me. The only animal we took was the donkey that I rode on. It was still night as I left the city through the valley gate on the west and went south past Dragon's Fountain to the rubbish gate. So this is the best description we have of the details of the ancient wall of Jerusalem, which we're reading right now. As I went, I inspected the broken walls of the city and the gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then on the east side of the city, I went north to the fountain gate and the king's pool. The donkey I was riding could not find any path through the rubble. So, where is this rubble coming from? Broken down down. wall. Broken down wall. So I went down into the valley of the Kidron. What do we know about the Kidron? It was a garbage heap where they threw all the trash, wasn't it? Okay, in the days of Jesus. Jesus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Valley of the Kidron rode along looking at the wall. Then I returned the way I had come and went back into the city through the valley gate. None of the local officials knew where I had been or what I had been doing. So far I had not said anything to any of my fellow Jews, the priests, the leaders, the officials, or anyone else who would be taking part in the work. He must have had some pretty good idea about... uh, But he's pretty circumstantial in detailing everything out, isn't he? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. He talks about walking through there in the dark and... But now I said to them, see what trouble we, yeah, I'm sorry. See what trouble we are in because Jerusalem is in ruins and its gates are destroyed. Let's rebuild the city walls and put an end to our disgrace. And I told them how God had been with me and helped me and what the emperor said to me. So what's he, what's, what's Nehemiah doing now? For the first time he's gathered the Jews together and he said, look at what happened. Let me tell you my story. And miracles, I'm sure he portrayed it very clearly as miracles. God has performed miracles to get us to where we are right now. And what was the response? They responded, let's start rebuilding. And they got ready to start the work. When Sanballat, Tobiah, and an Arab named Geshem heard what we were planning to do, they laughed at us and said, what do you think you're doing? Are you going to rebel against the emperor? I answered, The God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants, and we are going to start building. But you have no right to any property in Jerusalem, and you have no share in its traditions. He wasn't messing around here at all, was he? We can learn from Nehemiah's experience when first... What can we learn from Nehemiah's experience when first arriving at Jerusalem? What do you suppose... I mean... For three days, he he said and did nothing. What was happening? Just relaxing and recovering? He was probably praying. And he was... Probably tired. He was praying <laughs> and he was... He was planning. Researching. Yeah. We're looking around. I suspect he was doing a little researching, too. Called yeah. praying and mm-hmm. fasting and planning. Mm-hmm. Yep. Nehemiah recognized that there were probably spies in and around Jerusalem that would report to his enemies whatever he did. I mean, if a guy, a big guy comes up and he shows up with a letter from the emperor saying, give him whatever he needs, and now he goes off to Jerusalem. If you're Sanballat, what are you thinking? Something's going to happen. Yeah. Nehemiah doesn't take anything for granted. He could have sat down and said, tell me about the wall. What did he do? He checked it out. He wanted to see it for himself. He went out in the middle of the night with a very few trusted friends, walked around the rubble, which used to be the wall of Jerusalem. He found that there were significant portions of the wall which had already been built, but there were also huge areas where there were gaping holes. Then Nehemiah did something very important. Having assessed the situation, he called the Jewish leaders together and told them his own story. He showed them that he had authority from the emperor to do what he had come to do. Do you suppose he had letters? He had copies of those letters? Was there more than one copy so he could show them, okay, here's what the emperor has written to me, or did he have a separate letter for the emperor? 
Well, the Jewish leaders must have realized that what they were hearing was already a result of several miracles. When speaking to the Jews, he reminded them of how shameful and disgraceful their condition had become. And those of you who have lived or know about situations in the in the Far East, what's the story with shame and disgrace? In the Eastern countries, it's almost worse than death to be do something shameful. When speaking to the Jews, he reminded them of how shameful and disgraceful their condition had become. In many ancient systems, there was a shame and honor system. Honor was the most important value, and shame must be avoided at all cost. So Nehemiah convinced the Jews that they needed to take uh, care of the shame that they were experiencing and restore their honor. Mm. So, try to imagine being among that group that gathered around Nehemiah at that time when he proposed his plans. What would you have said? I mean, these people now have been living in that city, or some of them had been living in that city for a long time. 60, 70, 80 years. What is it, from five... 37 to 444, it's over 100 years, or right at no, 100. Yeah, close to 100 years. Close to 100 Some years. of them have been living in that city for 100 years, and they had tried repeatedly to try to get that wall rebuilt. Did any of them say, well, we've tried, we've tried, we've tried, it just don't work. There's too many people around here against us. We don't have any record of that. Why did they... What did they think was going to be different about this time? Well, they had the king's decree, <clears throat> and they they had somebody who showed up who wasn't just a alone, nobody. alone nobody. He came with with uh, plan. the uh, plan and also the the, the soldiers authority. that were yeah. escorting him. So it was obviously where obvious where he was coming from. You know, mm-hmm. he actually came from the emperor. And yeah, he yeah. must have been somebody that that exuded authority too, yeah. to and had a certain presence yes. with his yeah. maybe his uniform or yeah, he probably had some or, and the horseman or whatever. Just yeah, yeah, Persian so soldiers. Is that all it takes to convince people that you can do something that you haven't been able to do for a hundred years? Well, might well there might have been a new generation of young yeah. guys that said, "Hey, let's do this." Yeah, well, plans had to be laid almost immediately. He knows that given enough time, Sanballat and Tobiah are going to do what? Try to stop him. They're going to try to stop him whatever way they possibly can. And work had to begin. Nehemiah challenged them to trust in God since he had already done miracles and he would finish the job. God had prepared the way for the wall to be rebuilt and they responded boldly and courageously saying, let's begin building. And you remember how they did it? Well, some of them guarded, well, yeah. some of them worked. Okay. And they said, if we have trouble, we'll blow the trumpet, come help us. Okay, and more details than that, if you read carefully, and I don't know if any of our future lessons are going to detail this, but people basically said, we'll build the piece of wall near our house. Mm-hmm. So he said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that, or I'll build this, or I'll build that, I'll build that, I'll build that, I'll build that, and so forth around, and and... Different groups. Now, there were some outside groups that came in and said, oh, yes, we'll help, we'll build here. But most of the people who built, rebuilt the wall, they were rebuilding a piece of wall that was close to their house. Sometimes the house was part of the wall, too. Yeah. If you've yeah. been to Dubrovnik, you can look down off that wall and see homes that are on the inside of that wall. Yeah. It's Back to the building. question that... Uh, why they would respond to Nehemiah, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and this is from Prophets and Kings 638. Nehemiah's whole soul was in the enterprise he had undertaken. His hope, his energy, his enthusiasm, his determination were contagious, inspiring others with the same high courage and lofty purpose. Each man became a Nehemiah in his turn and helped to make stronger the heart and hand of his neighbor. What so, page is that? That's uh, Prophets and Kings 6.38. Very good. Third page. So, well, that's a good quote. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, obviously, he had the... He had... Charisma. Whatever it was. Mm-hmm. The salesmanship, mm-hmm. if yeah. you want to put it that way. 
So he talked about God's promises that he had been praying about for four months. Yeah, he certainly did. Um, did he, I mean, did he, did, he didn't suggest that they sit down for four months and fast and pray. No. We don't have time for that now. Did he perhaps quote passages like Deuteronomy 7, 9? Now that we have time, I'm going to read that. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful. He will keep his covenant and show his constant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commands. But he will not hesitate to punish those who hate him. And what about Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strength. He guides me in the right paths and he is, as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid, Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me. Do you think Nehemiah might have thought of something about that? Yeah. <laughs> all my enemies can see me. You welcome me as an honored guest and fill my cup to the brim. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life and your house will be with me as, and, and your house will be my home as long as I live. And finally, uh, Numbers twenty three nineteen, God is not like man who lie. He is not a human. He changes his mind. Whatever he promises, he does. He speaks and it is done. So what had Ezra, I mean, Nehemiah been praying about for four months? God's promises, right? God's promises that he, yeah. And actually he'd been praying long before that, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Do we know for sure that God wants us to finish the gospel? Yes. Carrying it to every person in our world? Yes. Yeah. Does God know exactly how this can be done? Yes. Yes. Is he asking for our help? Yes. Yes. Why doesn't he just send angels to do the job? Part of our our privilege. Our privilege and our preparation. Mm -hmm. God knows that we need that experience of, of actually helping to, to fin finish the gospel. We need that. We should note also that neither Ezra nor Nehemiah could have accomplished what they did and accomplished without permission uh, what they did accomplish without permission from the emperors involved. Those emperors were pagans. We're not exactly sure what motivated them to do what they did. However, when we know about what motivated Cyrus, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. My name's there. Yeah, exactly. However, they recognized, and we should recognize, that God is ultimately in charge. But we should not be afraid to work with non-church organizations or people that looks like that is what is necessary to accomplish God's work. I think about buildings that are being made right next to us here. Thinking about the age, do we have any idea the difference between Nehemiah and Ezra's age? No, we do not. But they're kind of contemporary. Yeah. We should not need to be reminded that Satan is alive and well on this earth. Yes, Gordon. So, one of the things you said is what is necessary to accomplish God's work. So, how are we sure that it's God's work and not our work? Well, that's part of what we... the months and months and years of prayer and study? Yeah, it's clear that, for example, the second coming is part of God's work. It's spelled out hundreds of times in the New Testament. So God is asking us to participate with Him in accomplishing that job. But they... This was building the wall of the city. Yes. Building buildings mm -hmm. currently. Building institutions currently. Okay, but Ezra spent 13 years preparing the people who weren't accomplishing anything at all before that to get ready for Nehemiah's coming. I'm not, he probably didn't know exactly when Nehemiah would come or how it would come or whatever, but he knew that he had been given permission to go there. And, I mean, you, you, you could ask, well, why, why hadn't Ezra tried to start people to, to get the wall built before Nehemiah showed up? We've suggested that he wasn't a, 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 you know, a political leader or whatever. But uh, 
We see something similar in Acts as far as the fasting and praying, where in uh, chapter 13 it speaks of in Antioch, and then it lists all the prophets and teachers who got together. And while they were uh, ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me uh, Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. And when they had fasted and were prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So that was yep. the first missionary journey. So there's sort of a uh, template there, mm-hmm. uh, much the same as Nehemiah did, fasting and praying. And and I, I wonder if maybe he wasn't just alone in the fasting and prayer. Yeah, it's maybe. possible he had other prayer warriors, as we call them. People yeah. prayed with him. Uh, whenever it is possible, he will Satan will oppose the progress of God's people because, of course, for him it is a life and death issue. Are there promises that God has made to us in our day that we could claim and should be claiming? Do we need to think That's, about that? That should be our lifeblood. Absolutely. Are we like the people of Jerusalem that have apparently given up? I mean, some of those people, we've already said, had been there in Jerusalem for close to 100 years. Mm-hmm. Would, would it be, even the young people, can you imagine the saying, but a little over Grandpa's been here for all these years and nothing has happened. As I think well, it was Paul said, perish the thought. <laughs> perish the thought, right, exactly. Um, as we have seen, Nehemiah had done his praying, his fasting, his careful planning, and then it was time for action. What would you have done? These these two men, it's very interesting. I don't know if we're going to get a chance to talk about this. This wall was no tiny little affair. They drove chariots along the top of this wall when it was built, when it was rebuilt, all the way around. So if you said, Gary, your piece of wall, I want it to be tall enough and strong enough so I can drive my chariot over it. There must have been a massive workforce, that's even like the Great Wall in yeah. China. I mean, that yeah. was that's big enough to drive yep. a chariot on. Exactly. So it doesn't go up overnight. No, it doesn't. But they they had manpower. Obviously, anyway, something to think about. We're challenging you to think about how all this could have been put together and how it all could have happened in accordance with God's will. Our kind and wonderful Father. These stories from long ago challenge us to think about what might be possible in our day. Try to imagine what Ezra and Nehemiah went through years and years of planning and preparing and thinking about the possibilities, but they accomplished it. We are in that same situation. Years and years we have been planning and preparing, but we need to think not about what our plans and our preparations are about, but what your plan is and what you would like us to do. Give us the courage, as they had, to step out and speak the truth on your behalf and finish the gospel as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.